Any matters to take up? Very well, then, Mr. Thompson, you may continue your cross-examination. And let me remind Professor Segura, you're still under oath? Yes, Your Honor. And the oath you took yesterday applies to this testimony as well. Yes, Your Honor. Very well. Your Honor, may I approach uh, the witness with... Uh, Four binders, eh? Just, just one, Your Honor. <laughs> <coughs> And, uh, Professor Sura, uh, I'd like to now talk a bit about and ask you questions about the political assets available to the LGBT community in the Prop 8 uh, campaign. And let me start by asking, Senator Dianne Feinstein publicly advocated the defeat of Proposition 8. Is that right? It's my understanding that she was opposed to it, yes. A and she's popular in California, is that correct? Uh, that waxes and wanes, but I think she, she won comfortably in her last uh, bid for re-election. And it was a political asset for the LGBT community to have her willing to speak on its behalf, is that correct? Yes. And Senator Barbara Boxer opposed Proposition 8, correct? That's my understanding. Governor Schwarzenegger opposed Proposition 8, correct? Uh, that's my understanding, but with the footnote that the governor also twice vetoed same-sex marriage, so there are other actions to consider. Uh, he vetoed it on the ground that it would be illegal under Prop 22? Uh, I, I don't know what his justification was in doing, so doing. Okay. Attorney General Brown uh, opposed Proposition 8, correct? Um, I'm, I'm not sure of that because I don't recall and I wasn't um, um, that aware of what the elected officials were doing, but that strikes me as consistent with his positions. Can you identify any statewide official who advocated on behalf of passage of Proposition 8? Uh, again, there may have been one or more, I don't know, but I don't have any off the top of my head. President Obama opposed Proposition 8, correct? Um, that's correct, but with an important footnote. So the president, um, during his campaign, repeatedly stated that he believed marriage was between one man and one woman, and his voice was used in, in, in contacting and messaging around that, that idea. So, uh, and I would also say that, that his opposition to Prop 8 was not particularly vociferously repeated. Nevertheless, I think it is his position that he was opposition. Do you think the use of President Obama's words, uh, the speech you're referring to was uh, at Saddleback Church with Rick Warren, where he said uh, marriage is between a man and a woman? I'm not sure where the where the snippet was was captured. He said it on more than one occasion. Um, but what what's the question? The, the question then is, wherever he said it, uh, his words were used by the Yes on 8 campaign, correct? I think they were used by, by someone engaged in mobilization around the issue. I don't know if it was coordinated with the Yes on 8 campaign or not. Do you think that was an effective political strategy to use President Obama's words in that way? I do think that that would be an effective strategy because um, it would serve to send a, uh, or to send a misleading signal that perhaps the, the then candidate was in favor of the proposition or to, at the very least, confuse the issue. Now, President Bill Clinton advocated publicly for the defeat of Proposition 8, correct? That's my understanding. And he's a popular political figure in California? I'm not, I'm not sure that that's still true, uh, but, but I think that was probably true at the time of the campaign. And were there any former presidents who advocated the passage of Proposition 8? I'm sorry, I, I don't know. Um, now I'd like you to turn to tab 54 in your binder. And this is a press release dated September 26, 2008, uh, produced to us by the Equality California. And it uh, is entitled, Levi Strauss and Co. joins PG&E as co-chair of No on Prop 8 Equality Business Council. And the first paragraph says, Levi Strauss & Co., one of the oldest and most prestigious clothing and apparel companies in the world today, joined PG&E as co-chair of the No on 8 campaign, Equality Business Council. Um, do, do you know how much Levi Strauss donated to the campaign? I don't. All right. Uh, Your Honor, we've moved the admission of DIX 2500. Okay. And, uh, DIX 2500 is admitted. Turning your attention, uh, Professor Segura, to the next tab, 55. This is a press release from Equality California, 
dated July 29, 2009. And the first sentence reads, our efforts to protect, protect the fundamental freedom to marry received a power boost from Pacific Gas and Electric Company to the tune of $250,000. Do you know of any uh, contribution of like size to the Yes on 8 campaign from a corporation? From a corporation, no. Uh, Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 2472. No objection, Very well. 2472 is admitted. And was this a political asset for the LGBT community to have major corporations like Levi Strauss and PG&E supporting the No on 8 campaign? I would agree that the dollars were a political asset. I am less moved by the notion that Pacific Gas and Electric sways many voters. Uh, now, in terms of celebrities, they can sway voters, correct? Uh, that, I think, remains an open question, but I think there's certainly a, an argument to be made on that behalf. Okay, and many celebrities opposed Proposition 8, correct? Uh, I would say that that's a fair statement. Yes. Uh, Ellen DeGeneres opposed Proposition 8, correct? Ellen DeGeneres did op oppose Proposition 8, but of course it's well known to most of the people in the courtroom that she's also an affected party. So uh, you could conceivably think that she was opposing on the basis of her membership in the, in the class that's affected. And, and Brad Pitt opposed Proposition 8? Again, I, I don't know the details of that, but if you present that to me, I have no reason to doubt that. Do you know of any celeb... Oh. My bad. Uh, do you know of any celebrities who supported the passage of Proposition 8? Um, I don't off the top of my head. So I'll, I'll begin with that. But there are uh, a number of celebrities uh, in the society who have fairly conservative um, social and political beliefs, and it, it would not surprise me that one or more celebrities did favor the passage of Prop 8. But to, to draw a name upon, I'm afraid I can at this moment of instant recall. And you don't know of any celebrity who publicly went out and campaigned for Proposition 8, correct? Same answer. I, I don't know. Now, uh, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the political opportunity structure. You testified yesterday about uh, analyzing the uh, forces arrayed against a group, and we talked about religious uh, organizations uh, yesterday. And so I want to now ask you some questions about progressive religious organizations. And there were a number of religious organizations uh, that have expressed support for the lesbian and gay cause of marriage equality, correct? That is correct. There are a number of, of uh, smaller denominations who do hold a more positive view of lesbians and gays. And I'd like to turn your attention to tab 56. This is an amicus brief filed in the in re marriage cases uh, in the California uh, Supreme Court. And if you'd look um, at, at turn to page 53 of the brief, which is the last uh, page that has numbers, and then flip one more beyond that to the table, which is entitled List of Amici Curiae. Do you see that, Professor? And isn't it true that there were literally hundreds of communities of faith, churches, temples, uh, synagogues, and religious leaders who supported the right of same-sex marriage, correct? As I expressed in my rebuttal report to Professor Nathanson's deposition, Mr. Thompson, um, there's a bit of intellectual dishonesty in presenting uh, the summation of uh, hundreds of communities of faith. What we have to do in order to evaluate the distribution of religious beliefs and religious sex on the question of whether or not they supported or opposed same-sex marriage or Proposition 8 is to look at the relative size of those groups. So, for example, the individuals who filed the amicus curiae brief included the, Metropo the individual organizations, included the Unitarian Universalists, uh, the United Church of Christ, the Metropolitan Community Church, and Reformed Congregations of Judaism. Collectively, they represent approximately 2% of the American public. And by contrast, the Roman Catholic Church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Southern Baptists, and several of the others collectively represent over a third of the American population. So when we say that there are hundreds of congregations that would have supported 
um, same-sex marriage or oppose Proposition 8, that is true. But it needs to be arrayed against the literally thousands of congregations who opposed. And there were Lutheran churches that opposed, correct? I'm sure there were some. And Episcopal churches that opposed? Um, the Episcopal church, is my understanding, they took no formal position on the, the matter. The six bishops took a position, did they The not? bishops may have stated, but the church, I think, formally does not adopt public positions. And there were certainly Episcopal parishes that uh, supported the right of same-sex marriage, correct? Just as there are Episcopal parishes who threatened to leave the Episcopal church over the ordination of homosexuals. Just as there are Episcopal churches who have threatened to leave the Episcopal communion over the ordination of homosexuals. What percentage of the American public is, uh, are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? It's very small, approximately 2 or 3 percent. Okay. Um, now, I'd like to direct your attention to tab 57. And uh, this is a document from the uh, Council of Churches, Santa Clara County, and uh, it's DIX 366. Uh, and in the first paragraph, it says, the council is proud to call your attention to the ad running in the San Jose Mercury News signed by 25 local churches. And it's true, uh, Professor Segura, that there was religious opposition to Prop 8 that took the form of ads in newspapers, correct? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 366. Okay. Very well. <clears throat> and uh, turning your attention to the next tab in your binder, 58, which is DIX 312, uh, this is a document from the Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church of Pasadena, and on the first page, the second bullet point says, no on Prop 8 rally today, and it describes a rally that was going to be held. And it's true that there were rallies uh, by religious organizations that opposed Proposition 8, correct? That is true. And again, Again, I would want to consider the rallies in favor of Proposition 8 and the relative size of crowds at each. And, uh, Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 312. Very well. I assume there was no objection. Okay. Right. Uh, turning your attention to the next tab in your binder, uh, 59, this is entitled UCC Church Takes a Stand Against California's Proposition 8, and it relates to the First Congregational Church of Berkeley, it's DIX 417, and in the first page in the third paragraph, uh, it states, in addition to formally voting to oppose the initiative, uh, FCCB, which is First Congregational Church of Berkeley, has been actively working to defeat Proposition 8 for several months. The church formed a marriage equality ministry team and now hosts weekly phone banks to reach out to undecided voters and deliver the message of fairness and equality for all our neighbors. And it's true that uh, religious opposition to Prop 8 took uh, the, the form of phone banking in some instances, correct? Um, in some instances, I would again assume that that's true and have no reason to doubt the veracity of the United Church of Christ's claim. Um, I would once again want to um, elaborate that the United Church of Christ is only approximately, well, it's even less than 1% of the American population, uh, and um, that a church in Berkeley was opposed to Proposition 8, well, the mind reels, but um, I'm not terribly surprised. All right. Uh, Your Honor, we move the admission of DIX 417. Objection, Very well. <clears throat> Turning to tab 60, this is a newsletter from the St. Francis Lutheran Church. It's DIX 388. Um, and turning your attention to page 5 on this document, right underneath the photo it says, St. Francis accepting donations to No on 8 campaign. And it says, Church Council met last Tuesday and agreed to accept donations on behalf of No on 8. So uh, there were efforts to raise money through churches for the No on 8 campaign, correct? Um, again, with my aforementioned qualification, yes. All right, uh, Your Honor, we move the admission of DIX 388. Okay. Turning your attention. Thank you. Uh, turning your attention uh, 
Professor Segura to uh, DI, uh, tab 61, which is DIX 325. This is the annual meeting of the Unitarian Universalist Church, and I'd like to direct your attention to page 52. And in the second paragraph, uh, it makes reference to the UULM, which is Unitarian Universalist Legislative Ministry, and it starts, the UULM Action Network PAC step forward to manage the statewide interface organizing to defeat Proposition 8, raising funds from UUs, Lutherans, and Congregationalists, hiring interfaith organizers, and coordinating the mobilization of people of faith throughout California. So there was an effort by uh, churches uh, who opposed Proposition 8 to manage a statewide organization, correct? Um, I can agree that what's represented in this paragraph suggests that there was an effort at coordination among the small churches who were supportive of same-sex marriage rights. Um, the paragraph actually doesn't provide me with sufficient evidence to evaluate the strength or, or organizational complexity. I, I just don't know. Uh, Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 325. Well, 325 is admitted. Uh, turning your attention to the next tab in your binder, 62, this is DIX 343. It's a press release from the United Methodist Church, and it's entitled, Faith Leaders from Across State to Speak Out Against Proposition 8. It's dated October 8, 2008. And if we look at the first page, and it, it may be easier if you just flip one since the sticker was uh, covering some of the, the language. Uh, so uh, it says, uh, clergy and faith leaders from across California will hold interfaith gatherings this weekend to stand against Proposition 8. People of faith are coming together and speaking out. And then a couple of sentences down, it, it adds, events will be held on Saturday in Los Angeles, Long Beach, San Diego, Redlands, Sacramento, and San Francisco. On Sunday, interfaith services will be held in Costa Mesa, Santa Rosa, and San Jose. So there was a, a, a widespread geographic effort to have interfaith services to oppose Proposition 8, correct? Once again, I can't speak to the attendance at these or to the relative size vis-a-vis -vis, um, the rallies and services on the opposing side, but yes, there were services held in broad geographic distribution. Uh, Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 343. Very well. Any way to kind of uh, move this along? We're, 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 we're moving, Your Honor, as quickly as I can. <laughs> All right. It does seem a tad repetitive. Uh, we're almost done with this uh, subject, Your Honor. I think I have one more document. Uh, and uh, this is the... Um, <clears throat> Tab 63 is DIX 428. This is uh, a document from the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force and directing your attention to the uh, first page, which is the fourth page of the exhibit, but it has a page one at the bottom. <clears throat> and on the uh, left-hand column, last paragraph, uh, it says, some of the most groundbreaking support of pro-LGBTQQIA equality is among people of faith. Religious figures such as Bishop Jean Robinson, Reverends Phil and James Lawson, Bishop Yvette Flunder, the majority of the rabbinical leadership in California, all of the Episcopal bishops of California, and countless other religious leaders spoke publicly on behalf of the LGBT QQIA community and received media coverage for it. And that's a true statement to the best of your knowledge, correct? Mr. Thompson, I have no reason to suspect that that statement is not true, nor would I suspect that the statements directly above that one in the exact same column are, are not true. Um, quoting, in particular, analyzing the role of the pro-LGBT QQIA religious organizing has become critical given that weekly religious participation was significantly, 
was significantly correlated with support for Proposition 8. Stated another way, the pro-LGBTQQIA movement has a problem with religion. So I want to make sure that we read these documents in their entirety and understand their, their, their true meaning. Uh, now, uh, and Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 428. No objection. Very well, 428 is admitted. <clears throat> All right, now let's move on to another subject. Um, you uh, talked about, Professor, one aspect of the political opportunity structure is the degree of dislike for a group, correct? That's correct. None of the uh, warmness readings that you, warmness temperature readings that you referenced during direct related to California, correct? They related to the national electorate. Yes. Uh, and there are more gays and lesbians in California than in any other state, correct? There's more of everything in California than in every other state. One That's out, true. One out of every eight Americans lives in California. But there's a higher concentration on a per capita basis. It's not just an absolute, it's a relative, the highest percentage of people in any state that are gay and lesbian reside in California, correct? Those numbers fluctuate, so I, I don't know for an absolute certainty that that is true, but it's certainly plausible and, and in fact, even likely. All right. Now, as a practical matter, part of the explanation for that is some gays and lesbians move to California because it is a hospitable uh, climate for gays and lesbians, correct? I would say it is a more hospitable climate for gays and lesbians than the one they left. And uh, it, there are more civil rights protections in California for gays and lesbians than in any other state, correct? Uh, that would appear to be the case. The absence of civil rights protections in many states uh, remains a problem for gays and lesbians. Now, um, one of those protections is uh, the domestic partnership law. Is it reasonable to conclude that many gays and lesbians in California supported domestic partnership laws in 2005? Um, supported them as opposed to no option, then I would say the answer would be yes. I'm, I would perhaps not be willing to say that that was their first preference for outcome, um, but with the option was no state recognition or domestic partnership, I think it would be fair to say that most gays and lesbians would support such a thing. Okay, now let's skip ahead in your, your binder to tab 69, and this is DIX 1068. It's a uh, press release from uh, Equality California, and uh, if you turn to the uh, second uh, paragraph, the last uh, sentence is a quote from Jeffrey Coors, Executive Director of Equality California, and he's talking about AB 205, the domestic partnership law, and he says, quote, by signing this bill, Governor Gray Davis honored all California families and reinforced the message that intolerance stops at the California border so there, it's true that there were those in the LGBT community who viewed AB 205 as honoring all families, correct? Um, as opposed to the pre-existing status, then yes, it was an increase in the affirmation and state protections afforded them. Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 1068. Okay. 1068 is admitted. And. Uh, Turning your attention to the next tab, which is tab 69A, this is DIX 1453. It's a press release from the National Center for Lesbian Rights, again pertaining to AB 205, and it says in the first sentence, the National Center for Lesbian Rights hailed today's historic signing by Governor Davis of AB 205, a groundbreaking bill that would grant same-sex couples most of the rights benefits and responsibilities granted to spouses under state law. So there were prominent uh, members of the LGBT community who hailed the passage of AB 205, correct? Uh, that certainly seems to be the case, yes. Uh, Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 1453. Okay. Well. Now, you also test, thank you, Your Honor. You, you also uh, testified, Professor, about initiatives. And you mentioned you, you had some statistics about the percentages 
of uh, initiatives that had targeted uh, gays and lesbians and how many had passed and not. And um, do, do you know how many of those initiatives uh, were held in California? Um, several. I don't, I don't know all, the exact number. Do you know the percentage of initiatives pertaining to gays and lesbians that were held in California that uh, targeted the gay and lesbian community and that passed? No, since I don't know the exact number in California, I can't compute the percentage. Okay. I, di I, I didn't know whether you knew the percentage uh, or not. All right. Now, let's uh, turn to uh, PX, uh, the next tab in your binder, which is uh, tab 70, and it's called Lose, Win, or Draw, a Reexamination of Direct Democracy and Minority Rights and this is PX839, and this is a document you considered in reaching your opinions in this case, correct? It is. And um, the, if we look um, behind the, the tab B, which is behind here, is that the supplemental appendix to this article? Mm. Uh, it, it appears to be. Have you made any attempt to analyze whether uh, the gay and lesbian community in California has done better in recent initiatives than it did, say, in the 70s or 80s? Uh, no, I didn't disaggregate the initiatives over time. Your Honor, we, we would uh, move the admission of PX839 with the supplementation of the appendix, the version of the exhibit that uh, plaintiffs created did not have the actual data of the uh, uh, referenda that were uh, included and underlay the analysis, so we would request leave to supplement this uh, PX839 with the appendix. Okay. Very well. As supplemented, 839 is admitted. Now, I'd like to uh, turn your attention to uh, tab 71A, and this is uh, a, a, an excerpt from a preface to Democratic Theory by Robert Dahl, and that's the same Dahl to whom you referred yesterday, correct? It is. All right, and if we turn to uh, page 30, which is the second page of the exhibit, uh, he says in the first uh, full paragraph, because majorities are likely to be unstable, and transitory in a large and pluralistic society. They are likely to be politically ineffective, and herein lies the basic protection against their exploitation of minorities. This conclusion is, of course, scarcely compatible with the preoccupation with majority tyranny that is the hallmark of the Madisonian style of thought. And don't we see this principle at work in places like New Hampshire and Vermont, where the legislature is passing same-sex marriage laws precisely because the heterosexual community is not monolithically opposed to same-sex marriage rights. Um, I note, Mr. Thompson, that the state of Maine didn't enter your description of states that passed it legislatively, um, and I think it's, it's illustrative. So. The paragraph, the, the one paragraph out of the book that you're that you're reading, um, suggests that there is that majorities are inherently unstable, and that majorities come and go. And indeed, one of the central principles of Madisonian protectionism, one of the arguments that Dahl makes in favor of pluralism, is that majorities are momentary, and that they'll fade. And indeed, one of the critiques of pluralism by scholars of minority politics, not just of gay and lesbian politics, but of African-American politics, um, and, and indeed any other minority group, is that on some issues, majorities can be quite stable. So, for example, uh, as I indicated, on a national level, it is still the case that more than half of all Americans find the defining characteristic of gays and lesbians, which is same-sex sexual attraction and expression, to be always wrong. Now, you pointed out that that number has actually declined over time, but it is still a majority. I think it's safe to assume that that majority has been in place for an exceedingly long time. The same is true on behalf of African Americans. Whites have been a majority of the population and have held power for a very long period of time. So one of the critiques of Dahl's 
pluralist theory. And one of the critiques of his defense of sort of Madisonianism is that there are some majorities that do not fade. There are some majorities that endure for very long periods of time. That breaks down rotation in office, and it break and rotation in office is what's supposed to um, temper or constrain the bad behavior of the majority who might find themselves in the minority at some near future time. So I think this paragraph is completely out of context. All right, now let's uh, turn to uh, back one tab to 71. This is called Gay Rights in the States, Public Opinion and Policy Responsiveness. It's DIX 1105, and this is a document you relied on in reaching your opinions in this case. Is that right? It is. All right, and let's turn to page 383. And directing your attention to the right-hand column, the first full paragraph, uh, and the third sentence, it says, it is also true that gay and lesbian rights are not particularly disadvantaged in states with majoritarian institutions. Having elected courts or direct democracy does not significantly affect the adoption of gay rights policies one way or the other. And you relied on this article in reaching your conclusions in this case, yes or no? It is. Uh, I did, and what Lax and Phillips are speaking of there is their question, which is, are legislatures more or less likely to adopt the policy? This is not an analysis of whether or not the policy endures. And, Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 1105. Oh, 1105 is admitted. Now, many times the gay and lesbian community is successful in keeping measures off the ballot, correct? Um, that implies an agency which I, I'm not familiar with. So um, many times measures that would disadvantage gays and lesbians remain off the ballot. Gays and lesbians may have and likely did play some role in that process. I don't, it would depend on the specifics of the process and the question in hand. Now, again, going back to the political opportunity structure that you described, um, it, it was the adoption of Proposition 8 a manifestation of the political obstacles confronted by gays and lesbians in California, in your opinion? I would say it, it's certainly a manifestation. It would be one of the results of political powerlessness. Um, again, as I indicated in the answer uh, to his honor's question yesterday, uh, a single election result is, or a single piece of legislation should not be considered to be uh, the basis for a conclusion. It's a piece of evidence. All right. And one of the obstacles that uh, gays and lesbians face in California to realizing same-sex marriage rights is religiously inspired opposition, correct? I would think that that's a, that's a national uh, issue, um, that the religion, quoting the document you submitted into evidence, that uh, gay and lesbian advocacy organizations think they have a religion problem. Right, and, and there are some individuals who voted for Proposition 8 because of Old Testament biblical prohibitions against same-sex sexual contact, correct? I think that that's a fair assumption. And uh, there are some numbers of individuals who might have voted for Proposition 8 because they believe their churches were going to be compelled to bless same-sex marriages, correct? Um, I believe that they had been led to believe that, so I think that there is some evidence that that could be true, yes. And it, it's possible, in your opinion, that some people voted in favor of Proposition 8 because of the negative reaction to the perception of activist judges, correct? Um, I would think that that's possible, but less likely. So um, scholars of um, American public opinion regularly bemoan the low levels of information that many voters have. Um, it is certainly an argument that has been used by uh, one side of the political spectrum to decry what they see as a form of judicial activism and, and to make um, the judiciary a scapegoat for, for uh, their views. Um, 
I'm not sure the degree to which that penetrates into the general public. I think many Americans don't fully understand the judicial process or even the judicial appointment process. Uh, I'm sure that it is the case that somewhere in California, someone probably voted on the basis of not liking those darn judges, but I can't really speak to what percentage that might be. All right. Now, in your rebuttal report that you put in in this case, you talked about the role of religion and how it may or may not inform views on same-sex marriage, correct? I did. I was responding to the um, expert report that had been put in by... The and, and we have decades of research on abortion opinion, social welfare, death penalty, to suggest that people's religious convictions shape their views of public policy, correct? I think that's a fair conclusion. Various measures of religion are a fairly robust predictor of lots of forms of political behavior, correct? That's correct. Most scholars of political behavior would suggest that when analyzing not only views about public policy matters, but also partisan identification and candidate preference, that religion is regularly identified as an important factor shaping people's attitudes, correct? That's correct. Everything we know about religious belief and identity and its role in public policy attitude formation suggests that the plausible interpretation is that religious people vote on religious beliefs, correct? Mr. Thompson, have you switched sides? Uh, yes, I think that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> the, the notion that deeply religious people do not rely on those religious beliefs when formulating attitudes about the world strikes you as deeply unlikely and unreasonable, correct? Um, y yes, but I would I want to put that in the context in which it was written. So the expert report to which I was uh, replying suggested that an alternative ex there was an alternative explanation, which was that increasingly increasing levels of religion or religious observance was connected to a non-religious reason for voting for the proposition, and no evidence was presented. And my response was that I found that logic kind of wanting, that if we show that people with higher levels of religious observance or more orthodox levels of religious belief are more likely to disfavor same-sex marriage, then we might logically conclude that those religious beliefs affected their vote on election day as opposed to some third intervening reason, which would be secular. Now, if you were asked to identify the percentage of those who voted in favor of Proposition 8 because of their religious convictions, it would be difficult to arrive at a specific scientific estimate, correct? Um, well, of course, there, there are, there's always uncertainty around uh, estimates of social phenomenon. There would be a variety of ways to go about doing it as a social scientist. Um, including the use of polling, um, uh, survey experiments, lab experiments. Um, we could look at um, sort of campaign messaging. There are uh, discourse theorists who would look at, at the language that people use. Um, so there's a variety of scientific methodologies that we could use to determine the distribution of votes you know, if we had you know, sufficient time and resources to conduct that study. Uh, but y you don't uh, have an opinion as to whether a majority of those who voted in favor of Proposition 8 did so because of their religious conviction, correct? Um, I, I'm, I don't know that I can make a, uh, a numerical point estimation. I, I just don't have the basis to make that claim. And, and in fact, um, but you don't even have an opinion. For, forgetting whether it's a, new, a specific numerical point, you don't know whether it's greater than 50 percent, correct? I, I just I don't have a I don't have a basis to, to to make an estimate, which I would need to do to decide if it's greater than, less than, or equal to 50. Now, members of some religious denominations voted strongly in favor of Proposition 8, correct? That appears to be the case. That members of the Mormon faith voted in favor of Proposition 8, correct? Um, that sounds plausible. A and a large majority of evangelical Christians oppose same-sex marriage, correct? I believe that's true, yes. And you believe that the correlation between religious denomination and attitudes about same-sex marriage is sufficiently high that it's reasonable to assume that religion is a motivating force for many voters, correct? So actually, I look at a variety of religious factors. 
So there are differences across religious identification. There's also differences across the frequency of uh, participation, so church attendance. There's also differences acro across the importance someone attaches to religion in their everyday life um, and beliefs about whether or not the Bible is the, the literal word of God. So there are a variety of religious dimensions that we could look at to, to assess religiosity, for lack of a better term. And across um, all of those dimensions, the ones that I identified in my report, there is a positive association with religiosity and unhappiness with or opposition to same-sex marriage. On the sectarian issue, I illustrated that there were different distributions for different sectarian identifications. And some sects are more vehemently opposed, and some sects are, are more mixed, and in some sects, it's not an issue at all. So all right. Now, let, let's turn your attention to your rebuttal report. It had been tab two, but I moved it after tab 72 so that we won't have to flip back. So should be right there after tab 72. Do you, do you see it, sir? I'm sorry, under tab 72. Well, we keep going. Uh, one more. Do, do you see? 72A. Yes. Yeah, okay. And do you see your rebuttal report? I do. Okay. Um, and this is PX827. And turning your attention to page 13 of the rebuttal report. This is a chart that shows, uh, actually, we need to look, I guess, first at page 12, where we can see what the columns mean. Column one is support for no recognition of same-sex relationships. Column two is support for civil unions. And column three is support for same-sex marriage, correct? That's correct. And then it's broken down by religious denomination, is that correct? It is. And if we turn to the next page, we can see that 0% of the Muslim community supported same-sex marriage, correct? Um, that's correct, but there are only five observations in the data set. Now, this is the data set you selected, correct? Yes, it's the National Election Study, and so we examine in, in 2008 there were approximately 2,350 complete interviews, and Muslims are a very small percentage of the United States. So as you get to smaller and smaller denominations, the uh, distributions will be less reliable. Uh, indicative, but 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 with a, a very large confidence interval around them. Is it reason interval? <clears throat> is it reasonable to assume that there is a connection between the Muslim faith and opposition to same-sex marriage? I think it would be fair to say that uh, it would same-sex marriage would be inconsistent with observant Muslim beliefs. Okay, and. Uh, Turning your attention to this table in your report, it shows 0% of Hindus supported same-sex marriage, correct? That's correct. Um, and is it reasonable to assume that there's a connection between the faith of the Hindu community and their opposition to same-sex marriage? Again, the number of observations is um, approximately six in the data set, um, but uh, I would think that that's a reasonable supposition, again, with a very large confidence interval around the estimates. All right, and uh, if we look up to the top of the page, we see that the Quakers, 100% of them, supported same-sex marriage, correct? All three of them supported same-sex marriage, yes. It's your data set. <laughs> Do you know of any better data? Um, on this, no. Yes. Okay. Alas, no. Okay, you use the best data there is available. So according to the best data available, 100% of the Quakers support same-sex marriage, correct? Um, yes. Okay. They did. All right. And uh, is it reasonable to assume that there is a correlation between their religious faith and their position on same-sex marriage? Um, among that very small subsection of the population, it would seem to be the case that their religiosity leads them to a different conclusion, yes. All right. And then if we look back to page 11, <clears throat> uh, to the table there, which lists uh, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish and other, if we look at the Jewish community, 80% of the Jewish community supports same-sex marriage, correct? That's correct. And so it's reasonable to assume that some members of the Jewish faith uh, support same-sex marriage because of their religious conviction, correct? Uh, that's a little bit harder to determine um, because I would want to look at the question of the other measures of religiosity, so frequency of religious attendance, um, literal interpretation of the Bible with regard to that community. I believe that 
certainly among Reformed Jewish communities, um, their, religious, their religion is, as I understand it, silent on the question of same-sex relationships. Now, I'm not an expert on the internal religious beliefs of, of various Jewish denominations. Is it conceivable that some number of religious people in California honestly believed that Proposition 8 prioritized the rights of children over the competing rights of gay people? And I'd like a yes or no answer. Yes. Okay. Uh, and let's look at religious resources. Do you know how much money members of the Roman Catholic Church donated to Proposition 8? Um, I don't have an exact estimate. Some of the documents that we went through in yesterday's um, testimony uh, made reference to very large donations by the Knights of Columbus uh, and by the Catholic community. I believe the summary comment from the Protect Marriage uh, organizers were that the Catholic community had really stepped up, but the exact number associated with, with the total, I don't know. I know the Knights of Columbus donation was $1.15 million. Now, you haven't been able to examine any of the internal documents of the Episcopal Church in this case, have you? I have not. So you don't know how much money Episcopalians donated to defeat Proposition 8, correct? Nope. And uh, with respect to the Mormon faith, you don't even have a rough sense as to how many organizers there were of the Mormon faith who supported Proposition 8, correct? How many organizers? Yes. Uh, could you define organizer at what level? Well, why, why don't we, we talked about the organizational structure. Why don't I ask it this way? You don't know approximately how many members of the Mormon faith campaigned in support of Proposition 8, correct? document that I read into evidence yesterday suggests that the Mormon Church itself believed it had 20,000 volunteers on several weekends. I have no reason to doubt them. Now, have you seen any internal documents relating to uh, the Episcopal Church on how many volunteers they had? I have not. Okay. And uh, you don't know how many members of the Catholic faith support, uh, campaigned in support of Proposition 8, correct? I don't. <laughs> and you don't know how many members of the Jewish faith campaigned against Proposition 8, correct? I, I have no idea. And have you made any attempt to consider the size of the religious events held in opposition to Proposition 8? Um, I raised that issue in my rebuttal report to Professor Nathanson um, because he identifies a list of events that took place uh, in opposition to Proposition 8 without considering the events in, in favor. Uh, I don't know the size of the events in opposition or the events in favor, though I'm told that um, the event in Qualcomm Stadium was quite large. The event in Qualcomm was quite large, but I, again, I don't know the exact numbers. Now let's look uh, at your rebuttal report um, and page 15. Back on what tab again? Uh, so this is tab uh, maybe 72A. Page 15? Did I only have 10 pages? Oh, you mean in the tables? Okay. Yes, the tables. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, um, and we can see that for those who never attend religious, uh, a religious service, 48% of them oppose same-sex marriage, correct? That's correct. And so there are reasons wholly apart from religious conviction that some people voted in favor of Proposition 8, correct? I would not dispute that. And conceivably, there are some individuals who themselves are not religious, but who believe marriage is a religious and only a religious institution, correct? That, that's conceivable. Okay, now I'd like to uh, switch topics. Perhaps we can get the witness to explain this table. Uh, I frankly don't understand it. <laughs> okay. There are a bunch of numbers here, and I'm going to have these tables referred to in evidence. It would be helpful for the finder of fact to try to understand them. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Professor, would you please explain for the record uh, how uh, each of these four tables, what the methodology was and what they purport to represent? Um, okay. Um, so, um, the, so turning back to Table 1, Your Honor, on page 11, the uh, American National Election Study asks religion um, in two consecutive questions. The first is they ask... Um, a broad identification question 
uh, what you see reported in Table 1, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, and all others. And then among um, the uh, groups, they then probe about individual sectarian identity. Um, so the others are asked, well, which other? Um, and uh, the Protestants are asked, which, which Protestant faith? Um, and so as we move from the first table to the second table, we just become more specific. The question that... Uh, that well, let's, let's go back to table one. Okay. We have columns one, two, and three. That's correct. They're labeled no recognition, civil unions, marriage. That's right. So the response... How, how do I read that? So the respondents were asked... Um, when confronting the question of government recognition of, of same-sex unions, do you favor um, full marriage equality, uh, a civil union institution which has some of the, of the responsibilities and rights of marriage, or no legal recognition? I can't tell you that that's a verbatim um, repeat of the question, Your Honor, but, but it's pretty close. Um, and so each respondent is allowed to say, well, I'm opposed to all government recognition, I favor civil unions but not marriage, or I favor full marriage equality. So what the percentages are in each of those columns are the percentage of respondents who um, fell into each of those categories across that row. The reason, the, the first number in each cell is the number of respondents and the reason that number is fractional is because sample weighting is applied to make sure that the sample is representative. Um, the numbers, if, I w if they were not weighted, would be very similar, but would be, be rounded off to, to full persons, obviously. Well, I read that first table, table one, um, column three, row one, to mean that 24% of Protestants favor recognition of same-sex marriage. Is That's that right? correct. 28% favor civil unions, 47% um, plus percent no recognition at all. That's correct, Your Honor. And so forth through that table and the second table. Right. Then what about the third table? Uh, table three um, asks the question um, about um, how important is religion in your daily life? And the response options available um, are very much, quite a bit, somewhat, or not at all. So what I'm trying to do there is to look at the, the uh, respondents' um, self-attributed religiosity. So how much does a religion affect my life? And across the top is the same three, question, three response um, possibility. Um, so for people for whom religion is not important in their daily life, about 60.5% favor marriage rights. So that's the first row, the third column, 60.4. Um, among people for whom religion is a very important part of their daily life, the comparable number is 21.64. So as we move from religion being unimportant to religion being very important, Support for same-sex marriage drops by approximately 40 points. Is, uh, is your honor happy with that table? Well, uh, it's not a question of making me happy. I, I, with, the <laughs> <laughs> with the understanding, uh, my apologies, with the understanding of that table. I think I understand it. Um, and table four? Um, so political scientists some time ago um, started to revise their, review of, uh, their view of religion in part because the role of religion in, in public life had become more prominent over the last uh, 20 years, 30 years or so. Um, and so we started asking an additional question, which is the question of um, biblical literalism. So folks who study religion and politics find that uh, measures of orthodoxy are closely associated um, with um, political views. And a key measure of orthodoxy um, is captured in this question on biblical literalism. So the respondents are asked, do you believe the Bible is the actual word of God, the word of God but not literally, or that the Bible was written by men? Um, and uh, written by men would be 
um, a, a less orthodox position, and the actual word of God would be the most orthodox position. So for, in, again, the same three categories across the top. So for individuals who believe that the Bible was written by men, 68.5% of them favor same-sex marriage. And for people who believe the Bible is the actual word of God, 19.4% of them favor uh, same-sex marriage. So the drop there is approximately 50 points from the least to the most orthodox interpretation of the Bible. Does your study show what percentage of the respondents believe the Bible was written by men, was the word of God but not literal, and was the actual word of God? Um, it, it, break that down? It does, Your Honor. I did, it's not reported here, but a little simple mathematics. So the, the actual word of God... Uh, there are 811, uh, approximately 811 cases out of the 2,171. So, I see. roughly speaking, that's about 39% or so, um, about 42% or so in the Word of God, but not literal, and then the 380. I'm sorry, my math skills, are, my math and the head skills are. Failing. All right. Um, and then the final um, table is opinion on marriage by frequency of church attendance. I apologize for the pagination. And um, so this is just simple, uh, a frequency of religious observance, uh, which uh, political scientists and sociologists have found to be quite telling. And so it goes from a high value of more than once weekly. So these are individuals who attend um, Saturday or Sunday service, as well as perhaps a prayer meeting or a Bible study or some form of religious meeting, all the way down to never. And so um, for people who never go to work, to church, uh, as Mr. Thompson has illustrated, um, uh, a bare majority, 52.2%, favor um, same-sex unions. And for people who go only a few... Same-sex unions or same-sex marriage? Same-sex marriage, I'm sorry. And for people who only go a few times per year, again, a bare majority, 51.18%, um, favor same-sex marriage. When we go up to people who go to church more than once weekly, um, the percentage who favor same-sex marriage is 11.9%. So you have a drop, again, of about 40 percentage points from never going to going more than once a week. Well, thank you very much. Uh, do you want to follow up, Mr. Uh, Thompson? No, Your Honor, uh, but I would like to uh, <coughs> move these tables from PX827 uh, into uh, evidence. No objection. I believe they are already admitted Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I'd like to switch topics, uh, Professor, and uh, ask you some questions about some of the violence and vandalism and harassment uh, that took place during the Proposition 8 campaign. And I'd like to direct your attention to tab 73, which is uh, an article written, The Price of Prop 8, and it's DIX 458. And this is a document that collects a variety of sources showing vandalism against supporters of Prop 8, correct? Um, that's what it purports to be, yes. So. And, and it uh, also collects a variety of publicly reported incidents of violence against supporters of Proposition 8, correct? Um, again, I'm just paging through the document. I've seen it uh, once before, but that, that seems to be it, what it's claiming to do, yes. Your, Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 458. I object uh, on grounds that it's beyond the scope of this witness's uh, testimony and that it's a hearsay document um, and that the events explained in it or reported in it um, should not be admitted to the truth of the matter. Didn't the witness t testify or at least touch upon in his testimony the effect of acts of vandalism or violence in connection with political campaigns. Didn't he touch on that subject? Yes, sir. Hate crimes. And, and your, your Honor, he specifically addressed the fact that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was attributable in large fact point to, to, to the fact that CBS broadcast the attack on the Selma Bridge and he testified to hate crimes and uh, we will submit uh, that some of the materials we're about to walk through uh, fit his definition of a hate crime as intended to intimidate 
uh, people who supported Prop 8. And it goes to his conception of political opportunity structure. He testified how in the civil rights community, uh, one of the tactics you can have is to appeal to a norm of fairness. But he said the moment you resort to violence, your ability to uh, uh, appeal to a norm of fairness dissipates. And so this evidence relates to that testimony too. I understand it's still hearsay, but I think it's probably appropriate <coughs> given that he is offering opinion testimony and therefore the objection will be overruled and 458 will be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we would uh, now like permission to uh, publish on the screen uh, BIX 2616. Uh, DIX uh, uh, 2616. Mr. Thompson, is there a tab associated with no, that? No, it's, it's something we want to put on the screen. Is it already in evidence? Uh, no, Your Honor. Uh, we, we, we thought it might be well to play it, and then if there's an objection so that they can see... What are we? What are we about to watch? It, it is a uh, short uh, minute and 24 second uh, news story that recounts some of the violent activities that took place in connection with Proposition, and relates to the subject matters that were just uh, that are covered in the uh, Heritage Foundation report. I would like the same objection on hearsay grounds, Your Honor. I'm, I'm not sure what is about to be played, but I'm happy to see it. Let the court make its decision. Happy? <laughs> Seems to be the standard. That we're <laughs> Happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, the battle over Prop 8 is heating up and even came to blows right here in San Diego. A 53-year-old man from Carlsbad was arrested yesterday for allegedly punching two neighbors in a fight over Prop 8 yard signs. He's a Doug Colt is live in Carlsbad with how the fight got physical. Doug. Well, Dan, Michelle, these two neighbors have had altercations in the past, but never before physical until last night when Carlsbad police say a yes on 8 sign drove one neighbor over the edge. It's very difficult to believe. You can see the bruises on their faces a day later. She I was just staring at that shock, yeah. shock, complete shock. I could not believe it, that anybody would be so manic, and that's exactly how he was. He was like a maniac. The neighbors have had their mix-ups in the past, but Carlsbad police say this dispute was over a Proposition 8 sign. Married for 36 years, Joe and Monica Scaticchio are proud to show their support on their front lawn. Their neighbor, 53-year-old Lawrence Pizziacara, shows his. When I put up my sign, uh, a couple days later I noticed that he put up his little sign beside me which said, no, no on Proposition 8. So that's what probably provoked him. Carl's bad police arrested Pizziacara for elderly abuse. He's currently in Vista Jail. Now coming up at 5 o'clock here. Uh, now, Professor, when... People see a video with an elderly lady with a bandage over her eye because she put a yes on eight sign uh, in her front yard. Does that have the potential to diminish support for the political goals of the LGBT community? Well, it is certainly an inflammatory image. Um, it is certainly not an image that would be uh, desirable um, by the by anyone associated with the campaign i'm i'm a little taken aback because um the the report suggests that these are neighbors with long long standing problems um and so I, I i don't know the specifics of the case i don't know if the person was convicted of any crime uh we didn't hear the other person's story so i i can't attribute um any veracity to the incident, but I can tell you that that particular news story would not have been favorable to the to the opponents of Proposition 8. Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 2616. I just 
didn't seem to me that there was a foundation laid, even by the reporter, for what prompted this altercation between two neighbors who had fights before. And in any event, I find it difficult to conceive of how it's relevant to the issues in this case. Well, we're not here adjudicating what happened in San Diego at this particular time. The witness's testimony is about the impact politically of reports of this kind. And so, for that purpose, I think the video is admissible. And once again, that's DIX. 2616. Very well. It will be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, Professor, I'd like to turn your attention to tab 74 in your binder. And this is a story that comes from the San Diego 6.com website. It's dated November 4, 2008. And here's what it says. Disputes over Proposition 8 campaign signs in Carlsbad left one man behind bars on suspicion of assault and at least one other alleged assailant at large Tuesday, authorities reported. The latter of the two scuffles over the ballot measure, which would ban same-sex marriage in California, occurred about 10 a.m. when a jogger spotted two men removing yes on eight signs in the area of Avaria Park and Cormorant Drive, police spokeswoman Lynn Diamond said. When the witness confronted the thieves, one of them pulled off the witness's hat and smashed his eyeglasses on the ground. The attacker's large black and tan dog then bit the victim in his upper leg, causing deep puncture wounds, according to Diamond. At that point, the assailant, a man who appeared to be in his late 30s or early 40s, wearing shorts and a polo shirt, ran off along with his companion, who was also leading a dog. Is this the sort of incident that when people read about this on the Internet would have the potential to diminish political support for the LGBT community? Yes, Your Honor. Vague, ambiguous question. Objection overruled. Once again, not speaking to the specifics of the report, any adverse publicity associated with one side or the other would be detrimental to their cause, and apparently in this case detrimental to Carlsbad. Your Honor, we would move the admission of DIX 1725. Same objection that's irrelevant in your statement. Very well. I'll admit it. Turning to tab 75, this is a story from October 13 from the International Business Times, and it's entitled Prop 8 Supporter Violently Attacked for Distributing Lawn Signs. And in the second paragraph it says, Prop 8 Supporter Jose Nunez, 37, was brutally assaulted while waiting to distribute yard signs to other supporters of the initiative after church services at the St. Stanislaus Parish in Modesto. The assailant grabbed about 75 signs and yelled at Nunez accordingly, What do you have against gays? Although Nunez replied that he had nothing against gays, he was attacked anyway. The assailant punched Nunez in the left eye and ran off with the signs. And is this, again, the sort of story that would have the potential to diminish support for the gay and lesbian political movement? Objection, Your Honor. Irrelevant. Your say. Cumulative. Potentially, though, I don't know what the readership of the International Business Times is in the California electorate. I'm not familiar with the publication. And the source of the story is protectmarriage.com. It's sourced on the bottom of the press release. Now, I'd like to play one more, one last video, Your Honor, on this subject. And it is... Where do you see the... Oh, I'm sorry. We're not there yet. Where do you see the source being? Three lines from the bottom on the back page, Your Honor. I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong exhibit. This is exhibit... DIX 1609, Your Honor. Oh, I see. All right. You may proceed. All right. Now, turning your attention to the next tab in your binder, which is 
tab uh, 76. Um, this is a story from the San Jose Mercury News. It's dated October 28, 2008, and uh, it, it states uh, the homeowners, Tom and Kelly Byrne and Frank and Evelana Ibarra, had yes on eight protect marriage signs posted on their front lawns on Southgate Court for about a week. The Burns and Ibarra's friends who live across from each other on the small cul-de-sac had their gar garage doors spray painted in large letters with the words no on eight. The no on eight slogan refers to the hotly contested Proposition 8 ballot measure in next week's election that would ban same-sex marriage in California. The rear window of the Burns minivan was also hit with red spray paint. Does this sort of vandalism have the potential to diminish support for the political goals of the LGBT community? Um, it, it, it does, Mr. Thompson, with the qualifying statement that three paragraphs from the bottom in the story, it reads, the No on Proposition 8 campaign issued a statement saying it, quote, condemns vandalism and activities of this kind that are in no way connected to the No on Prop 8 campaign. So it is clearly activities that the No on 8 campaign disavowed, and that disavowal certainly would have an ameliorative effect uh, on, of the story. And the reason they disavowed it, in part, uh, aside from basic decency and fairness, would be politically, it's kryptonite, correct? Um, it's politically not advantageous, but as to the motives of why the, the campaign disavowed it, I have no reason other than to believe their statement. Yeah. Uh, Your Honor, we would uh, move the admission of DIX 1792. Very well. 1792 will be admitted. Turning to the next tab in your binder, which is uh, tab 77. Um, when you get to the end of this line, uh, let's take a break. Okay. Uh, and in fact, um, at this point, we would like to uh, publish uh, another uh, video. This would be uh, DIX 1673. This is a video entitled Vandals Target Downtown Fresno Church. Downtown Fresno Church? Yes, Your Honor. Well, let's see it. <clears throat> see what it. Vandals targeted a downtown Fresno church that supports a California ballot measure that would eliminate the right of same sex couples to marry. Workers at Cornerstone Church got to their offices today to find the offices and the sanctuary, which is in the historic Wilson Theater, had been egged. Crews are working on cleaning up the mess this midday. On Sunday, a rally supporting Proposition 8 was held at City Hall. Cornerstone's pastor, Jim Franklin, told other Prop 8 supporters his home had recently been a. Now, um, and are you aware of the fact that the mayor of Fresno received uh, death threats? I have, I have no knowledge of that. Okay. Were, were you aware that pastors received death threats in connection with their support for Prop 8? And I have no knowledge, no direct knowledge of that. If, if that were true, would that tend to diminish the ability of the LGBT community to appeal to norms of fairness? Um, that it would diminish the ability, I would say yes, but because I don't know the origin of the death threats, or even if perhaps the threats were staged as part of the Yes on 8 campaign or people who were sympathetic to that, I, I cannot attribute the motive of the individuals involved. From a public relations standpoint, certainly it, that is not helpful. And, and, Your Honor, we have come to a convenient uh, stopping point. Very well. Well, before we take our break, uh, and counsel in this matter can uh, step aside for a moment. We have another matter to attend to, and a somewhat happy one. Uh, is Heidi Timken or Chris and Christopher Gonzalez in the courtroom? Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. For Heidi Timken, are you? I am. And Christopher Gonzalez? Yes, Your Honor. And you're seeking admission to the Western District of Texas, Austin Division, correct? I trust you have a matter down there. We do. Before? Uh, before Judge Yackel. 
um, you're members in good standing of this court yes. and of the State Bar of California? Yes, we are. Very well. If you'd be so kind as to raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear that you will discharge the duties of an attorney counselor at law of the Western District of Texas faithfully and that you will demean yourself uprightly under the law and the highest ethics of the legal profession and that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States? I do. I do, Your Honor. Very well. Good luck in Texas. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> you need to sign. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You need to sign these things. <laughs> All right, Council, why don't we take until uh, 10 minutes after the hour, and then we'll resume. How much longer do you have with this witness, Mr. Thompson? Um, I, I apologize. It's going a little slower than I anticipated. Yes, so, it is. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. Perhaps maybe another hour. Maybe you can streamline things. And I'll do my in. best, Your Honor. All right, fine. <laughs> 